This is Rumble, and this is Michael Moore, and I um, am glad to have you all back here uh, today. Uh, as I uh, mentioned in the previous uh, podcast, the previous episode, um, we are about to hit our 10 millionth download, uh, which is something beyond crazy because the the podcast people had told us that... that um, I forget what it was, Basil, but it was sort of, it was like by the end of the first year, if we got maybe a half a million or something, we'd be doing really good. Uh, and so in, in uh, four or five months here, we've got 10 million uh, downloads of this thing. So first of all, thanks to everybody who's been listening. And we'd like to um, have a little contest here uh, by the end of this weekend, uh, we're going to have the... Uh, We'll have the 10 millionth rollover. We'll have that. The, 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 the odometer will roll over and we'll see the 10 million. So we'd like to uh, give somebody a prize uh, for anybody who's been downloading it uh, this week. So um, all you have to do is just send me an email uh, to Mike, M-I-K-E, at michaelmore.com and just say that you're in on the uh, number 10 million. You, you have downloaded it this week and you want to be considered as the 10 millionth uh, uh, down downloader and uh, we will have a drawing probably this weekend and uh, pick the lucky winner and and uh, uh, we'll figure out something we'll figure out a good just assume it's going to be a good prize because five million the five millionth person uh, won a, a free trip to New York and got to it's you know going to be on the uh, the podcast uh, here uh, shortly uh, she couldn't do it back when we hit 5 million because she happened to be in the army corps of engineers and was running around the country building hospitals for us. So that turned out to just be kind of a cool side story to this, but uh, we'll hear from her and, uh, and we'll hear maybe from one of you um, if you would like to be on the podcast and, and win the prize, whatever that prize happens to be uh, just uh, drop me an email and we'll do the drawing Mike at michaelmore.com. Um, and that's all you got to do. Uh, so, but do it now because we're going to, we'll do, we'll do the drawing, I think, uh, certainly by Sunday. So, um, that's that we have, uh, as our guest uh, today on rumble, um, uh, somebody whom I have known for uh, a number of years, known of her before I knew her, uh, because, uh, in the state of Michigan and certainly in the uh, city of Detroit, uh, she's already live and listening right now, so I don't want to embarrass her, but she, she, if, 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 if you were to ask in this decade or two, um, who comes to mind of the people in, in Detroit, in the Detroit area, and a number of them do come to mind who have fought, fought for the people, fought, uh, uh, the moneyed interests who do not have the rest of everybody's else, everybody else's interests at heart. Um, who was that fighter for the people? And, um, and in this case, uh, one of the first names, if you asked anybody, especially in Southeastern Michigan, uh, who that person would be, they would say the name Rashida Talib. And that is who is with us here today. Rashida, You're the thank only you. one that has my name like that. Yeah. No, but, yes. Even because the president, even, he says it so oddly weird. But you you say it very powerfully. It's Tlaib, and that's it. And so, and so here you are, and I'm doing all the yelling. Um, so uh, <laughs> you are uh, just so people who are not uh, familiar, you are the representative, the congressional representative. You are a member of Congress for the 13th uh, congressional district in the state of Michigan, which um, covers essentially. Uh, and you can correct me if I have this wrong because I'm yeah, no, of, of I'm a flame, but it's it's essentially the yeah. the western side of Detroit that then bleeds into um, various uh, townships uh, that that are making their way to a place called Dearborn. Um, do I have that right? Would you say that's a so it has like Dearborn Heights half yeah, of that, but city. but not yeah, Dearborn it's itself. Pretty- no, nope, not Dearborn. People think I represent Dearborn because I'm Arab and I so only could represent Arabs. But 
Yeah. And it goes from the yeah. east side of Detroit and it stays all the way from, and then it stay and it goes to the airport. You say your it, district it starts on the east side. Of Detroit, east side? Yes. Yeah, it does. Wow. It has yeah, but it has Highland Park. Uh, it comes across, it's really odd. One side of seven mile is in my district, the other isn't. It's very gerrymandered, so I'm really looking forward to the Man, the knife was taken to this district. district. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> yeah. It's so odd the way it like pops off of the river. Like it doesn't even touch the riverfront and the way south parts of Southwest Detroit is cut up like completely in half in certain areas. It's very odd. There's like rectangles of neighborhoods. Uh, again, it's the, the art and the, the failure of gerrymandering um, where, you know, certain communities are cut up the way they are. But here's what's, so, what's, what's interesting, um, um, certainly to those of us from this area is that I mean this is this is is it safe to say this is a majority black district majority African American? Oh yeah, it's um, close to sixty percent African American. Sixty percent, okay. Yeah. And and what percent of it would you would you call white? They say between thirty to forty percent, but there is about five percent Arab. Probably uh, same same for for Latino community, but yeah, it would I would say sixty thirty maybe. Five percent Arab, five percent Latino, but okay, you know. So right. I think the census is completely off as, as usual from ten years. So ago. a district that's sixty percent African American and then at least five percent Latino. So there's sixty five percent there elected. So the district is only five percent Arab American uh, elected um, a a, a Palestinian American to represent them. Please explain. Yeah. I, I, yeah, <laughs> you're always so funny. Um, look, I, I grew up, I was born and raised in Detroit. I always, you know, center the work that I've done all of these years is in the Wayne County communities. So I think for so many of my uh, neighbors and residents, uh, they see beyond me being just, oh, the Muslim or, you know, for them electing me wasn't, oh, let's make history and, and elect the first Muslim woman or the first Palestinian woman. It was Oh, we want that girl. She's not going to sell us out. Oh, isn't that the one who took on Maddie Maroon? Oh, isn't she the one who j- jumped over fences and got some samples of petroleum coke that the Koch brothers decided to dump on the riverfront and didn't give a shit about people's public health? So it, it, it was more of, you know, around my actions and the fact that I think, you know, Michael, a lot of my residents, I have the third poorest congressional district. So these are frontline communities uh, that have felt uh, the impact of environmental racism, have felt the impact of dirty uh, air and, and, and water, have felt the impact of the economic divide that's really shown its ugly face during this pandemic. All of that to say they really wanted someone that wasn't going to waver or be you know, bought from you know, corporations. I was the only one that was running that wasn't taking any corporate PAC money. And so I think they, they, they were like, yeah, we can't pronounce her name, but you know, she's at least not going to sell us out as soon as she gets to Washington D.C. Yeah, well, that yeah, I'm yes, they everybody, nobody would assume that of, of you, even even if um, their politics even might be a little different or whatever. They they know that you can't be bought, and uh, because we've seen you in action uh, all all of these years, um, but I I do. I know that people sent you to DC because of you, they, because you have these years and years and years of, 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 um, participating and, and you worked at, at this law center that was, how can we describe what this is to people? Cause there's other, there are law centers like this in other parts of the country where well, the I lawyers. Yeah. Yeah. Go well, it's ahead. like a worker center, right, Michael? I mean, it's, it's really the place it's, it's become more than just even like, worker center, but anything to deal with workers. So for instance, you know, we file injunctions against corporate polluters. Um, We have taken on, um, you know, issues around funding for local municipalities. But we are, uh, you know, we, I say we still, because I always feel like I'm still part of that that family, but the Sugar Law Center, which is a national organization started by um, uh, Jane and Maurice Sugar, uh, which was Maurice Sugar was like the first UAW labor lawyer, uh, I believe, and uh, really believed in um, sta- changing the structural mess that we have now uh, that really leaves people, uh, you know, under like poverty levels and, and, and all that. But this is a center that kind of takes on really big fights. It's almost like it, it lands at the doorstep of, uh, you know, temporary workers. We fought really hard to get 
um, them, uh, you know, um, uh, stolen wages, uh, fighting back against uh, the work, you know, workers getting sexually harassed in the workplace, all those things. But we we take on these big fights, and but we're very small. And even though we're national, we're in the backyard of, of Detroit, you know, where movements have been birthed left and right. I feel like in so many ways, um, what Sugar Law Center is an extension of kind of the belief that Maurice felt, uh, Maurice and Jane Sugar felt that, you know, just because you may not have billions or millions of dollars in the bank, you still deserve human dignity. You don't deserve to breathe dirty air. You don't deserve to be felt less than at work or feel unsafe at work. So it is really one of those community-based organizations that has, um, you know, helped build even capacity for other organizations. I mean, we filed these Freedom Information Act on behalf of so many organizations that revealed like Detroit, Detroit homeowners got overtaxed by $600 million, Michael. I mean, you know, again, many of these local groups don't have the capacity to do that. But Sugar Law Center jumps, you know, comes in and is able to to push back and say, Nope, we'll do it for you for free. Uh, That's why we were established to do this. And yeah, we, we fight back against all these forms of oppression. It's yeah, it's a great, it's a wonderful thing to have. I mean, like for years, I, you know, if you're a New Yorker, people remember William Kunstler, um, but you know, and, and, uh, and his, um, uh, I forget the name now of his, it's of his uh, sidekick. Um, but, um, but we have this, but this is like a center of, of counselors and, 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 uh, you know, all the lawyers who fought, uh, for the farm workers union, um, who fought for wounded knee, who fought, you know, it's, it's like, it's like, this is all in this sort of one, one place. And, and it's like anybody who was in any kind of trouble like this knew that, that the lawyers, you and others, the people that work there would be there to, to fight for them. But I just, I, so I'm, I'm, I'm just saying that because people know you in uh, Detroit, know you very well. For me, it was, you know, I even heard somebody say, uh, like, if there was, a, you know, you've taken on big bullies here at home, you can take on this guy, you know, it, it's more of them kind of seeing because my style is very uniquely different. I remember, you know, uh, even my opponents and others were always criticizing, well, look at you, you, you trespassed to get, I say, yeah, because people were being poisoned. And the state kept telling me, oh, don't worry, the petroleum coke, which is literally, you know, toxic waste a byproduct of like tar sands from Canada, the dirtiest crude oil you can imagine. And they're saying, hey, no, take it. Uh, don't worry that that's breathe it all in. It's not going to cause any cancer, or any respiratory issues. And, you know, people would like snicker and kind of like when I say people, I'm talking about colleagues, you know, outside of yeah. the, the legislature, outside of those that are elected. I mean, they got it. They're like, good for you. Do what you need to do uh, beyond just introducing bills that may never become law or beyond, you know, uh, this kind of like debating back and forth on the house floor that doesn't change people's lives immediately. So, you know, for them, they heard it. I mean, I'm being the eldest of 14, taking people, taking care of people all my life. I mean, it's just, there's a sense of urgency that comes from the way I work that I think for them, it's like, it's Trump and the policies and everything that comes along with it. But there was this sense of like, we're tired of waiting. I mean, again, I represent the third poorest congressional district. I don't think people understand out of 435 congressional districts. So when I say to people right now during this pandemic, the third poorest. I actually, you're saying it's the third poorest. Third poorest. And I mm. actually have people in my district in that country. has no access to water. Exactly. In the country. Right. They don't have access to water during a pandemic to wash their hands. I mean, they don't have any of that. Right. I mean, so, right. You know, Michael, it's 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 just not about like, of course, you know, the the icing, I think, or the kind of cherry on top or whatever you want to call it. It was, oh, and holy shit, she's Palestinian. <laughs> that that was like an afterthought. But I think people were like, yeah, you know, she's taking no, on it Maddie. Is, it is an afterthought. Because, because, yeah, because yeah. we already knew you and we knew you all those times that you fought civil disobedience. By the way, how many times have you been arrested in civil disobedience? <laughs> I mean, uh, technically... Technically, I think twice. Um, oh no, no, there's more than yeah. that. What are you not? <laughs> well, what are you not copying to? Them, Come on. Some of them laugh, and some of them call it detent. You know, I've been detained multiple times. I'll tell you that how, much. How many? Multiple. Okay, how many times have they put handcuffs on you? Handcuffs on me, uh, twice. Yeah, twice. Just twice. Yeah. I have got footage somewhere. <laughs> that's 
<laughs> it's more than twice. Okay, d- well, detained. I, I, All right, I, I, you I, use the word detained. I understand yeah. you're a member of Congress now. How many times have you been detained? Detained? Oh, at least a half a dozen times. Yeah, at least. Thank more. you. Finally, <laughs> finally, I'm getting it out of her here. This is <laughs> this is nothing to be ashamed of. This is this is why we're proud of you, uh, because you are that fighter. And so you went to D.C. and um, and decided uh, that you were. How have you done this? Because you know, I know I have other friends, people. You know, um, my buddy Dan, who represents Flint uh, in the Congress. Oh, it's yeah. man it's when great. they first when they all first go there, they're just stunned by the game you have to play, what you have to do, who you have to bow down to, and all this stuff, and. Um, you know, and, and yet you have kept, uh, that, that wonderful smile on your face, but I know, I know deep down this, it, it just the struggle of it, you know, how in these two years, how have you been able, uh, to maintain in spite of all the BS that you have to deal with? Oh, it's the best way to describe it is something you said to me once, which you said some crazy shit to me, but this was actually really profound. You I have said, said a lot of crazy shit to you. That is true. I'm sorry, I'm sorry <laughs> yeah. for all of it. Uh, no, no, it's good. It's just like, I'm like, who thinks like that? Only Michael Moore. Um, but I, and, and, and I half of Flint. <laughs> I don't know. I just remember driving with you and you were like, God, if something ever, cause I drive crazy as you know, and I, you were like, God, if something happened to us, there'd be so many conspiracy theories about how we died. But one of the things I was like, I don't know who thinks like that, but one of the things you did say, which was really great is you say every time you land in Detroit Metro, you remember this? Every yeah, time you yeah. land at the airport in Detroit Metro that you feel like, ah, you're like, everything's going to be okay. I just want you to know, like I come home, I'm blessed that I'm only like an hour or so away from DC, a flight away that yeah. I come home every week. And it matters, but I also created these service centers so I can stay really rooted in, in what's going on. I think it's Ayanna Presley who says, you know, you got to stay connected to the hurt. If you don't stay connected to the hurt, you're going to be, you know, because I'm so fearful. Uh, Michael, I mean, there's a colleague of mine, you could see he's just numb. You know, he was Mm. sitting next to me and he goes, Hey kid, how's it going? You know, I'm a kid compared to many of my colleagues are really up in age. And so I, I said, I said, it's okay. You know, he goes, Oh, what, you know, what do you like about it? What do you don't? And I said, you know, getting here, I was just ready to, you know, I'm ready to hit the ground running. And I keep getting told not now, wait, you know, let me go do something about auto insurance. Oh, let's have a hearing, but you know, we got to wait, we got to be careful. And there's a lack of urgency, you know, everything's slow here while people are dying from a broken healthcare system. It's it's so slow here Mm. dealing with like, you know, the economic issues, the poverty crisis in our country, all that. So he looked at me and he kind of, you could see that he, he kind of remember, he goes, God, I, I do kind of remember that feeling that same way when I first got here. And he's been there for a while, but I, I do believe coming home every single week, really, you know, being engaged with community-based organizations like Sugar Law Center and others and staying connected to the pain and the hurt. I know that may sound odd to people, but I think realizing like there's so much, uh, uh, you know, work to do by hearing the stories about those that don't have water and uh, the schools that had to shut down their fountains because of dirty water, all those things, uh, again, I think will help make sure that I don't become numb, that I don't, I, I, you know, don't believe that we should be waiting. I mean, my folks have been waiting too long for some sort of real tangible action that transforms their lives today. Why, why haven't more people just given up, just realized that the system is never going to do anything to help them. And, and you know what I'm talking about? Cause I can, I can tell you stories from Flint where, um, you know, p- people in 2016 just stayed home. They just like, what's the point? And um, how do you, how do you speak to them because they're going to trust you because they know you as, as a truth teller in Detroit, but, but how do you tell them that? Yes, there is still a chance for some hope. There's still a chance for us to hold the power that we, the people are supposed to have. You know, I, I remember the teachings of Grace Lee Boggs who said, you know, transformative change doesn't happen in the halls of Congress. 
uh, some of the most transformative things didn't happen because, you know, somebody in the White House decided it was critically important. It was because the the streets demanded it. But I also tell them, don't you want to live, like really live? If you really want to live, you got to fight for that. I mean, do you, don't you want to breathe clean air? Don't you want to be able to not worry about where your next check comes from and, and not worry about your boss firing you, not having health coverage, all those things? Uh, you know, they win when we give up, when we become indifferent. But I know, I mean, I think of things that, that the labor movement did. And, you know, here in Detroit, I mean, we, we birthed it. We, we, every corner is a reminder of it. We weren't able to get the workplace for protections, but for the fact that we organize workers, we would never get retirement. People will never talk about the things that we were able to do. And many of these workers are the ones, if it wasn't for them, we would have never had the Clean Air Act. Uh, and, and all of the things that I think really transformed, uh, our country. But now, you know, I, I, I do think we, um, not only my colleagues becoming numb, it's like when the people become numb, that's when we're losing. So yeah. we, we got to push against that and say, and, and that, I always tell them, I always personalize it for them and say, don't you want to like really live, like live your life. Um, and when you're, when you're fighting and you're demanding more, to me, that's living. Uh, that is like saying you deserve better. What is it about Trump this week where he is just, he's been this way for the last few weeks, liberate Michigan, uh, all these it's attacks on Michigan. What is, with the what, what's the obsession? I, I mean, I've tried to, people ask me about it. Like, what is that? What is it that he's, what is he obsessed about? And the only answer I have is that um, we, the people in Michigan, in 2018, we removed all the people that look like him from power in Lansing. The top four positions of power in Lansing, and people who listen to the podcast have heard me say this probably too many times, but we have a woman governor, we have a black uh, lieutenant governor, we have a lesbian attorney general, and we have a single mom who's our secretary of state. <laughs> and that's who's running in Michigan. And this has somebody told him this. Maybe he was listening to the podcast when I said it, when I put it that way, but it fried his brain. And the fact that two Democratic women in white suburban Detroit kicked out the Republicans who represented mm -hmm. white suburban Detroit. Now it's represented by women, women, two women, more women, you know, binders full of yeah, women. I mean like Alyssa Slotkin's mom is, a, you know, was uh, an open, uh, you know, gay relationship. Right. And I mean, they both have these like lived experiences too, that, you know, m make them very much outside of kind of this box of what people think uh, should be representing us at these various levels of government. But, you know, I, I, look today, I called him president incompetent. I try not to do the name calling because it seems to distract people from, uh, what needs to be done. But at the same time, I, I feel very much pushing against him, especially when he threatens to take money away that would save lives. You know, we were trying to help people be able to vote by mail. And, you know, it's threatening to him. It's democracy threatens him. The people voting threatens him. People, women in power threatens him. Mm. He's so threatened by the fact that, uh, and, and, you know, more and more of us are you know, not sitting on the sidelines, we're running for office, but we're also speaking up. And, you know, we're a lot more competent, we're a lot more leading with compassion. I mean, I tell people like some, there's a unique lens with women in office, like, you know, people used to kind of make fun of it and say, you're too emotional, you're too this, you're too that. And, and I say, uh, uh, they're actually looking beyond numbers, they're looking at need, they're looking at the pain, they're looking at all these issues. And that lens is powerful, especially in this environment where, like I said, there's a sense of a, a lack of urgency. Uh, I think for for many of us, all of us very much moms or daughters or, you know, we're always taking care of people around us. Uh, and we're very, you know, uh, I think, uh, thoughtful and smart about how we represent and speak for many of the people that elected us. And, you know, he, he can't, he can't fathom, he can't control us. It's a right. control thing too. I can <clears throat> feel it. It's every tweet. It's got it. It's driving him crazy somehow. And then on top of the people I mentioned, there's you. So the, your district was represented by John Conyers for, for decades. And mm -hmm. so now you represent uh, that, that district. And it, it just seems like, um, 
I don't know what it is, but he, um, but I'm glad, you know what? I'm glad that it's rattled him. Uh, nobody bothered to tell him in this tweet, uh, from yesterday or the day before when he, when he said that, uh, uh, the secretary of state in Michigan was election fraud because she was sending out absentee ballots in advance. And it's, he doesn't know that we passed a constitutional amendment two years ago in the state of Michigan, making it the law that all voters can vote by mail. Anybody. There's mm-hmm. no such thing as the mm-hmm. absentee ballot anymore. It's everybody gets to vote by mail if they want to, and you don't have to have a reason. Um, right. And we got rid of the uh, the thing that they would do when you go to vote, and they make you try to prove this or that or whatever. You don't have the right documents, and they turn you away. Can't do that anymore in the state of Michigan. That's against the law. And then we made gerrymandering illegal, essentially, because we our new constitution now, this amendment, says that there has mm-hmm. to be um, a, a commission that's set up every 10 years that decides, and it has to be nonpartisan. It's no, there's no more, you know, uh, drawing the map to favor your party or whatever, or to draw it to favor certain races. Um, it, it, and the Republicans are trying to literally defund the whole commission, which is ridiculous because it was so overwhelmingly supported to do an independent commission. It's interesting because when I was my first year uh, in an office in the legislature, it was a Republican that introduced a bill to create an independent commission prior to the ballot oh, yeah. measure. Even. It was, it's unbelievable that something that I thought was very bipartisan supported all of a sudden now becoming partisan. Again, it's, it's the threat. Like they know that more people want to see, you know, government be about people and not corporations and not the, the, the very yeah. few that I think need to be just. The, the only reason that this constitutional amendment passed in 2018 was because Republicans voted for it along with Democrats. It was obviously majority Democratic, but it was, I think it won by 61%. It was a landslide of Michiganders who said that there should be no more voter suppression and we need to make voting, uh, you know, easy uh, for people, not hard. And, um, and Republicans and Democrats agreed with that. And now here we are two years later and they are going to, are you worried at all? That, I mean, do you think there's a chance that Trump is going to try and not have this election this year, try to postpone it, try to do, use the uh, COVID-19 as the reason? Um, I mean, I'm worried about this and I, and it's well, not, I, the, I'm not Michael, even in the paranoid. Uh, <laughs> pool well, here. You, you have actually one of the people that uh, continue to remind me never to underestimate him. And I think we continue to underestimate um, yeah. what he's he's capable of, uh, and 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 his minions following him. You know, I I sat next to a, a Republican senator once, and he, you know, the president came up on the stage, and uh, you know, they could see that my body tense up. I I get you know uh, you know kind of holding my breath because I know he's going to say something that I think promotes violence, promotes division, um, and he leans in and and he kind of whispers to me, you know, I pretend I have, you know, muffles on my, like, I pretend that I can't, you know, like I have like these things covering my ears so that I don't hear him and pretend he doesn't, he's not speaking. And I've looked at him and I thought to myself, then why didn't you vote to impeach him? Why are you continuing to enable him by saying nothing when he continues to promote things that are very lawless, uh, very unconstitutional, uh, very much goes against I think, you know, the, the, the very essence of, of, you know, our democracy. So it's, it's really interesting um, where everybody's like, oh, that can never happen. I said, I don't know. He bribed a, a, a foreign government. I, I think anything is possible. He did it and nobody held him accountable, right? Other than the House Democrats. And Oh, my God. I can't, I can't believe anybody I would say that this. Look at just the last week. He has removed five, five inspector That's generals. Right. In the Defense Department, in the in the uh, Secretary of State's office, in um, um, the the people, the, the person that was looking at, at how the PP uh, uh, E the the protective gear wasn't being handled right, the person that 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 where the whistleblower came to on the on the whole thing that led to Trump's impeachment, he has removed the watchdogs, the oversight people so that he can just do what he wants to do. And there's been no uproar about this. I mean, be, I mean, in part because most people's minds are on, on making sure they don't die or a family member doesn't die right now in this pandemic, or how am I going to pay for things? When am I going back to work? Is there going to be work? 
what about the kids and school? Every, you know, this is what is occupying everybody's mind and a perfect time for somebody. Um, what does he call himself? A very stable genius. So a ver- perfect time for a very stable genius to act, to remove the watchdogs, to remove these, these, these parts of our democracy that keep it a democracy and, and, it's and corruption out. I mean, it's so corrupt. Yes. We have a crooked CEO in the White House. It's corruption left and right. And everybody's just watching it happen, you know, and, and it's so frustrating because we're constantly told, okay, let's not, t- let's not focus on him. Let's focus. Oh, great. I want to focus on all of us do. I think people are so, uh, you know, cause it's so toxic. It's so, I mean, look at me, you can probably hear my breathing change because I'm so angry. You know, I don't know if it's the mom in me, but listen, this guy needs a time out or something. I mean, he needs to be put away, uh, uh, away from this like position of power where he's in, to me and very much creating irreparable harm on so many of our folks and different programs and things. I mean, one of the first things he did when COVID, you know, when the pandemic kind of came about, first thing he did that week was, oh, we're going to go ahead and, and EPA. They issued like an executive order of some sort. We're not going to um, enforce Clean Air Act or the Clean Water Act. You know, EPA, right. you can, I'm like, what does that have to do with the, if more than anything, you need to be doing that more. It's like, is he doing it as a favor? What's going on? You know, there's all these contracts being issued, the, the commingling of the Trump organization versus the administration, all of that. Uh, again, you know, and it creates a, that's a precedent. You know, in so many ways, Michael, oh, oh, like, I think yeah. it continues to away with this, this dangerous precedent of, oh my God, when is the next crooked CEO, you know, billionaire going to run that is, is going to do the same thing? Cause we've shown them that you can get away with it, that we don't have to worry about it, that it's yeah, very I think, much, I, um, Rashida, I think even worse than the, the precedent and many precedents that he has set is that before we even have to worry about the next, um, uh, billionaire oligarch, who's going to think that he can be the president of the United States. Just the fact that by saying, okay, we're not going to, and using COVID as the excuse, we're not going to enforce the clean water act. We're not going to enforce the clean air act. And here's what, here's what's going to happen. Um, and I think people know this too, because we've, we've seen, we've seen things close up and go by the wayside here just in these first two or three months they will not go back to enforcing it. Once they've stopped enforcing it, once they've let everybody go, who are the enforcers, we're not going to get back in his, in his administration, at least we're not going to go back to enforcing it at all. That's what's really going to happen here. People are going to forget about how this has happened and they're going to be worried about the next wave of the pandemic. And there's not going to be any, we're not going to go back to it. It's, it's just, this is a small example, but I saw this, I was watching sports center last night on ESPN. Sorry. And, um, But they announced that Central Michigan University um, has decided to um, um, essentially get rid of the men's track and field team. And and I thought, wow. And then they said other universities are doing this across the country because, you know, the colleges are are hurting for money now during this, during the pandemic. Yeah. And they got to start cutting some sports. And I thought, you know, Central Michigan, Chippewas, um, that's the last Mm -hmm. you've seen a field of, of track and field that, that will not, that will not come back um, because they'll just say, you know what, <laughs> what do we, it's, it's, it's 36 students and two coaches. We don't need that. We got to start cutting corners here and they're going to use this. Businesses will use it, but institutions will use it to cut corners and to say, we don't really need to spend money on that anymore. And my fear is, is that we're going to come out of this hurting even worse than before we went into it when we were already hurting on things that weren't being covered, things that weren't being paid for. Now that's the pessimist in me. I mean, the optimist also says that every friggin' American, I think that's got half a brain. So that's a good 80% of the country right there. Um, his, <laughs> I know I'm being generous, but I'm, I'm in a generous mood today. They, they have seen that the healthcare system is broken. And that crazy man from Brooklyn with the, with the white hair flailing all over the place was right when he was trying to say that your, your, your health insurance should never be tied to your job. Everybody thinks, oh, I've got a good job. I got good, good benefits. Well, what if you don't have that job? 
whether it's a pandemic that ends your job or whether the boss wakes up in the morning on the wrong side of the bed and says, you know what? I'm going to, I'm going to double the deductible here. Uh, they, I'm too easy on these employees. And with a snap of the fingers, he can do that under the, under the healthcare system we have. I think now Rashida, maybe, and maybe I am being too optimistic here. I think that we might come out of this with some of the things that we thought were going to take years to have happen. It may actually happen with caveat, a new president and flipping three seats uh, in the Senate. Would do you share any of this optimism? I mean, I think for me, it's, it's what, fe- what I fear is, you know, a lot of uh, people that I kind of talk to, there's, there's those that um, don't realize what we used to have and what's been taken away from us because they weren't really around or didn't fully understand what, what, how it was before, if that makes any sense. So when you, when you even talked about track, I think about, you know, the young people, I was kind of congratulating a part of this fellowship program, you know, money from graduating from high school. And I said, you know, when I graduated from high school, I, I actually had like a driver's license. There was driver's ed. And they're like, say what? I was like, yeah, we, we, they offered free driver's ed as part of, you know, your high school curriculum. They had, you know, this many counselors, this, and the kids are like, I didn't know that it's even possible. My worry is, is, you know, pessimistic, I guess, side is I worry sometimes that people don't believe they deserve better or they don't know that there is better, if that makes any sense. But the one thing that I know, yeah. yeah, people don't realize like, yeah, your insurance doesn't have to be attached to your employer and other countries do that, uh, do what we're trying to do, right? I mean, it, it, it almost feels, even when I'm trying to push for reoccurring payments, direct payments to individuals, you know, hugely supported in my district and saw some great polling that shows Republicans, Democrats support reoccurring payments during COVID instead of bailouts for corporations. And, you know, the overwhelming, like, concern that I hear from, like, some of the folks that are like, oh, well, you know, but really, do we really need that? I said, I don't know, maybe, maybe you need to look at the numbers, but a third of our neighbors could not pay rent uh, in April. I don't even know what the numbers are in May. And then, you know, I said, do you know that close to 35 million or more have, you know, our unemployment benefits, some are never going to have a job to go back to because of this pandemic. That's how bad it is. Uh, you know, and, and just even talking about, uh, the student debt, everything. I mean, when when people mention how much like tuition was and how there was all these kinds of grants and things, you know, high, you know, that college was so much more accessible. You know, these folks are like, I can't believe it used to be like that. I'm like, yeah, and it just kept getting worse. And and that's so for me, I, I worry about one people really truly not believing they deserve it, that it's that it's possible, and two that people don't realize like what actually was even taken away from them from public schools to what happened in the healthcare industry where, you know, I watched DMC right here in the backyard, Detroit medical center turn from a real nonprofit or, you know, hospital to a for-profit, you know, collaborate, like literally this tenants company it's called tenant uh, own, you know, for-profit and you could see it's run like a business. It actually is not even lucrative right now for them to take care of, you know, people with COVID. So they have to have all these other procedures and all these other things. And people don't realize, guess what? That's really not a nonprofit anymore. It's actually run by a for-profit that, that company and corporation that looks at numbers, not quality healthcare, not need, not saving lives, right? And so uh, people don't realize, yeah, DMC changed because people are like, it's, this is, it seems so different, Rita. And I said, because you don't know behind the curtain, the whole system has changed. Up front, it looks like still it's like a nonprofit. They say they're a nonprofit, but behind the scenes, it's run by a for-profit. So again, I think, you know, there's so many layers to what we're talking about, Michael, but- No, but the main point uh, is uh, that these things happen and they happen quietly and the people don't know. And then I'm sure there are people listening to this right now that, that just said to themselves, and these are educated people listening to this podcast, what? What do you mean? No clean, clean air, clean water act enforcement. Mm-hmm. What do you mean yeah. that? Yeah. Well, that's because 95% of turn on any news channel. It's, it's, uh, it's the coronavirus, Um, and, and it's a perfect time for these, for these people, these bastards. I'm sorry to, to use that language, but I'm just, um, you know, for them to get away with this stuff. And, uh, and yeah, I worry, I worry. 
you know, compassion or even empathy from them, right? In I mean, Detroit, even now as about, these so-called water. Yeah, yeah. But th- what's been going on though in Detroit? It's just been heartbreaking to to see. I mean, I got stuck. I was in New York when this started, and I, you know, I have an apartment up in up in northern Michigan where I live, and then I have an apartment here when I work in New York, and so I, I was working in this the lockdown started when I was here. So I'm, I'm, I've been here, but it's been heartbreaking to see um, how many people have contracted the virus in Michigan and especially in Southeastern Michigan and how many people in Detroit have died. And, and the percentage of people of color who have died has just been unbelievable. And I just, with the, how are you dealing with this? I mean, you, it's gotta be awful on you. You're there. You're representing them. Yes. So, well, and, and I think for so many of our black neighbors, you know, I, I mean, I born and raised in the beautiful black city. I mean, it's 85% African American now. And one of the things that is hard when you see these numbers of 40% African Americans died from COVID in Michigan, where African Americans only make up less than 15% of the total population. So think about that for one moment. Wow. And, you know, that is un- incredible. And And then, but then you read statistics like, well, one of four Detroiters are so-called essential workers. You know, they weren't current essential workers a few months ago, but now they're essential workers, right? They're out there uh, putting their lives uh, on the line to provide people with groceries, to, to you know, moving those, those kinds of items together. And so I, you know, I think structural racism, uh, even environmental racism, I mean, many of my African American neighbors are literally their backyard is the steel companies is, you know, many of the working class have been really hit hard with COVID. So many pre existing conditions, all those things that 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 are happening and now and, you know, COVID has shown the ugly face of that type of structural racism. Uh, and so many of the advocates that we spoke to, we just had this amazing conversation with national advocates like, you know, Dr. Cornell West and others. Uh, I think even Dr. West was like, everybody seems so surprised, but what do you expect when you, you know, this is what happens when you oppress people, when uh, they're not given, you know, uh, equitable funding for education, equal access to, to the same jobs that, you know, anybody would, would want to be able to have access to all those things. Uh, but the stakes were so much set against so many folks already. It's just really hard. Uh, I, you know, I cried when I had to call. I mean, I, it was the hardest conversation uh, call I had to make was when we lost the youngest uh, person in Michigan, a young African American five year old girl yes, named Skylar right. Herbert. Yeah, and you know, her father was a firefighter, her mother a police officer, both considered essential workers, have to first responders showing up at work. And when I picked up the phone and called over there. The grandmother answered, and Michael, I mean, I said, hey, it's Congresswoman Tlaib, but just want to check, and, and immediately just broke down. I cried, and we cried together. And just the parents thinking, God, they might have brought something back to their child, right? And mm-hmm. and the fact that, you know, but because of what happened, then finally everybody's like, hey, maybe we should be testing all first responders. Uh, oh, maybe we shouldn't be asking for prescriptions uh, as a requirement to get testing, which is a huge barrier. A lot of people don't have primary care doctors, Michael. I mean, so when people say a, a lot of these, uh, you know, uh, well, you can go get testing. It's like, no, there's all these bureaucracy and, and stuff that's set in place that really excludes people. So that's why I've been a big proponent of like mobile testing. I've got a few. This I got, got to go to one tomorrow at one of my senior centers that's predominantly African Americans, and and getting everybody tested, but. Uh, it is really heartbreaking. And even talking about Skylar uh, on the House floor and talking to people about the fact that we really don't understand this pandemic enough where, you know, first you at first they said African-Americans couldn't get it. Do you remember that? Then they said right. children couldn't get it. Right. Then they said, you know, all of that is completely every single theory that has come out of this incompetence uh, president's mouth and and all of the the folks uh, that are around him, you know, advising and giving. I mean, this information is just awful. It, it really, you know, it really killed people. Uh, and I really believe that. I believe we could have saved lives if we just spoke the truth. We don't know. Be cautious uh, that we recognize, uh, you know, the the racial divide about access to healthcare and and the fact that the economic divide played a huge role 
uh, for so many of my black neighbors, again, that, you know, still had to show up to work uh, with no masks for a long time. We had a fight for grocery store workers, Michael, to get masks um, and gloves. And, and they were asking for it before anybody demanded it, right? I mean, they were like, hey, something's wrong here. We don't try, we really would like some masks. Uh, so it's just really hard to watch it all happen. Uh, I think a, an activist, a fellow activist on the call that we did about how black communities across the country are impacted said, you know, when, when does it stop? When, when do they stop seeing us as being disposable? Mm. And it just broke my heart. Yeah. Yeah. It's, and especially I, I try to explain Detroit to people who aren't from our neck of the woods and, um, and, and growing up, especially, um, even though I grew up in and around Flint, it, it, um, the idea of going to Detroit was really like, it was almost like going to Oz, Mm -hmm. you know, it was, uh, it was, um, it, it was like a, both Flint and Detroit were sort of a, you know, they were a working class paradise in a way. Um, I mean, they had, they had their problems and lots of, lots of issues and things over the years, but it's still, um, it's still, I think anybody, anybody who's part of the Detroit or Michigan diaspora that is, that exists across the country, because you run into everybody, it seems, uh, somebody, um, if, if back when, back in the days when I would travel or tour, um, and there's, there's a fondness that people have and a memory that they share about the city of Detroit and what it's what it has given us and what it has given the world. And I'm just curious how you, how you answer that question, because, you know, a lot of times, you know, like, especially in the news, Detroit will have this, you know, this bad rap or whatever. And of course, a lot of it is racially tinged, if I can put it that way. But it's, it's something, it's something that I think is, I don't know. It's, I, not to, not that we would be different people if you or I had been raised in Chicago mm-hmm. or Kansas City or whatever, but I'm just saying uh, there's something about Detroit um, that has been good for how you or I turned out, um, and, I, and the same for Flint. Well, I tell everybody, you come here, uh, you leave stronger. Uh, you leave really incre- – it's almost like somebody just, you know, put get, you know uh, clean energy in you and made you believe. Uh, I think there's just a huge fighting spirit here that you won't find anywhere else. I always tell, you know, I always feel stronger being here that, uh, you know, all the brokenness around the world and around our country and the policies and everything, when you come here, you know, people believe you it's broken. They, they get it and they, they want to do something about it. Uh, I mean, I go to protest every, everybody has a kid on their shoulder. Like it's not, you know, there it's like families come out to these things to demand access to water. It's families that come out and say, we need to unionize, you know, uh, Amazon uh, warehouses. All of that to say is it's just kind of embedded in the culture here. But I mean, I look, I was born in an era where we had Mayor Coleman Young of 20 plus years as our mayor, who, you know, got into power in, in, in you know, being the first african-american you know this mayor who's just like i don't care what y'all think this is we're gonna have we're gonna have self-determination we're gonna decide we're gonna go ahead and have more african-americans in the police force we're gonna do all because of all the you know from the rebellion in 1967 and 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 down of just how much there was still this you know form of oppression and kind of racism with various policies that still existed uh you know, African-Americans rose up and said, nope, not enough. We're going to run for office. We're going to decide. But then as soon as that happened, what you saw over and over again is is disinvestment from the state government, disinvestment, uh, uh, you know, kind of neglect on on various, you know, tax revenue sharing. Uh, I saw them come in and literally allow uh, the largest municipal bankruptcy to happen in Detroit. It would have never happened in any other city that did not, was not as black as ours. I'm telling you right now, what happened to pensioners, what happened to so many folks, uh, the way they put emergency manager uh, in place where they removed everybody elected uh, is, is, you know, again, I don't think it would have happened in communities 
where they were, you know, wealthier uh, and and not as black. Uh, and so I, you know, always tell people there the this form of you know, watching people kind of just using Detroit as some sort of punching bag, but look at, look what's going on there. I emphasize uh, to many of them, many of these issues is because of that, that form of structural racism. I mean, in the legislature, because I was an African American, you know, I'm Arab and I'm sitting there talking, somebody's like, well, I don't want to, you know, these are colleagues, democratic colleagues from, you know, different parts of the, the, the state who said, well, we, we shouldn't be sending more money to, to, to Detroit. I said, why? Detroit almost at that time we said so Detroit almost has a million people. Uh, it is the largest city in the state. It's at the anchor. It has two, you know, it has two international crossings. Twenty seven percent of trade comes through that that city. It, it literally is the hub of of the auto industry. And and they look at me like, what do you mean? I said, well, the next other most populated city is I think I don't know if it's Grand Rapids or something. But it's like two hundred thousand people. I mean, understand that there's more people. There's more need, but people didn't see it like that. Uh, they they just saw the the that it's being led by African Americans, and I don't think they really realized, honestly, Michael, that you know that form of stereotype, whatever the form of like, you know, lens, it was blinded, uh, yeah. very much so by what they've been taught, and yeah. and it, intentional or not, it resisted. I, I heard it in various tones in these kinds of, again, these are colleagues of mine that, God, they fought with me for children literacy and fought for all this stuff. But boy, when it came to Detroit, they want to even used to say, well, I don't want to look too pro Detroit. What does that mean? Mm. What does that mm. mean? Yeah, yeah, we know what it means. We know what it means. Yeah. It's a, uh, um, but I, but I resist it and I fight it. And I think, you know, uh, like if you have somebody like uh, comes to Detroit, um, uh, somebody who has never been to Detroit and you pick them up, there at the at the airport in your um we'll just call it a chevy truck um but um <laughs> the one you drove me around in yes yeah um, it's not bad you stop mm. telling people to beat up chevy it is not yeah, i did not say it's beat up chevy i truck. just said i said i, I know chevy truck people that yeah it's not a with, chevy der truck. with derision it's with not. derision in my voice a derisive <laughs> tone um but you're um, the one who got into my car i you, you i looked at it and i did i got in it and uh and i you know i still i was trying to remember some of the prayers uh that i had learned as a child uh, <laughs> while we were barreling down the freeway but no but seriously though when you pick somebody up like where where would you take them where do you where would you want to take them in detroit to give them a a real sense of the the, the vibrance uh, and the vitality and the humanity I, and the food oh the yeah, yeah. You know, it's funny. I always tell people like they always want to come and learn about Detroit. They go meet the mayor and the elected, you know, city. I was like, no, 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 no. Let's go to a block club. They're like, what? I was like, let's there is no I mean, our neighborhood block clubs are the shit like they are amazing because it is, you know, a lot of them are seasoned residents, you know, retiree auto workers, uh, yeah. the lady who, you know, worked. Yeah, they're amazing. I would want to take them there. I mean, I, I, I think even just the, the kind of conversation they have, like uh, about uh, doing the neighborhood cleanups or talking about up to date kind of things that are happening or, Hey, did you see that neighbor did this? You know, whatever it is, there's, there's something beautiful about that kind of chosen family, right. That you have with your block right. club that very much meets the spirit of, of, of the city I grew up in. There's also these uh, unofficial, we'll call them restaurants, but in people's homes, people have, there's home cooking that goes on. Yes. And Anthony Bourdain yes. actually is the first person outside of Detroit that ever showed this to the rest of the world, that you literally yes. could eat some of the finest cuisine like, you know, anywhere in the that? world. What's that? It's, it's amazing. It, well, I was always telling somebody, you know how people are like, oh, I know the underground scene of music. I was like, oh no, but there's a guy named Jesse Gonzalez from Southwest Detroit who will give you a underground scene of, of the food, you know, the, the, the home cooked meals. I mean, it's amazing. Uh, uh, what, what the, the, the underground, I call it the underground just cause you know, it's the, it's the kind of only the neighborhood knows which houses are like the made right. restaurant, but <laughs> right. it's great. Cause Jesse will take I mean, He'll take you from one place to another. The one woman who makes the best, like, you know, chicken soup to the next woman who makes the best uh, tamales to the next, it's amazing. Uh, it's incredible. 
What do you think too? What is it about Detroit? Like with music, you brought up music that, that there's so, so much has come out of Detroit, not just the obvious, you know, Motown, which is huge. Um, but Aretha, who was not part of Motown, um, uh, but not just that, all kinds of, there's this, there's even a, a form of music now in the last decade or so called Detroit techno. It's, there's a festival in Detroit every year. There's like a million people that show up. Oh, it's crazy. I've never seen crazy. Like and like, I had no, I had never heard of this. There's an actual genre of music named after Detroit, Detroit techno. <laughs> but then there's also, there's the, the, the white rock and rollers, the Bob Seegers mm-hmm. and the, and then, of course, you know, some of the top, top people, uh, Jack White, in hip, yeah. uh, Jack White or, uh, uh, Eminem, uh, uh, Iggy mm-hmm. Pop. Iggy Pop is considered like the, the, one of the originators, the godfather of, of punk music. Um, and, and Madonna. Um, I mean, it just, it, this list could go on and on, but it's, it, it, I'm bringing it up because it's such a diverse genres, oh, yeah. genres of late- music. Yeah. But why Detroit though? Which, why Detroit? Oh, I don't, know. I don't You know, one of the things I love, uh, my dad taught me this, Michael, my dad was, you know, worked at Ford Motor Company down in down river in flat rock, Michigan. Uh, yeah, we have these cool names for these different, uh, different cities, but yeah. he, he <laughs> loved how when you walked onto the, to the floor, you know, the, the, you know, auto ma- uh, manufacturing, like floor, the assembly floor, yeah. Yeah, and yeah. how everybody was equal. Everybody's one. It was like in, in because everybody was part of this like UAW, and and you saw how like whites and blacks and everybody just kind of got together, organized together against the boss, right? Against the the corporation, the company, uh, yeah. and really organized yeah. each other. Mm. It was a late night uh, talk show host. I can't remember his name. Was interviewing me, and he said it was so cool. Detroit. I've never seen white and black folks walking together, and I just thought, what mm. poor sad thing. I was like, what do you? You see that a lot here. Uh, and it's it's through music and through the various cultures of Detroit and uh, uh, and, and all the fact that the and the unions the UAW oh, yeah. very very right. early on insisted right. that the assembly line be integrated. Way th- right. this is like way long. This is this is before the modern day civil and rights movement. Told me it changed. It completely changed his even just view because. He, even, you know, versus, uh, you know, the things that he was kind of taught. I mean, you know, he only went up to fourth grade education, came to the United States at 19 years old, but even as an immigrant, right? I mean, it's your dad, it, right? It completely, yeah. My dad, he completely transformed his lens to be alongside, uh, you know, different colors of people, different uh, folks and, and, and building these cars and then going out there and organizing for healthcare, organizing for their families, uh, livelihood. Uh, there, there's some, there is, I mean, even now, if you look at, uh, I have Detroit Jews for justice who literally work with we, the people to demand access to water right now. It's beautiful activism happening. Um, but even if you look at sugar law center, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's amazing to see this collaboration and it's, it's white and, and black lawyers coming together saying, no, you won't, you will not cut people's pensions. You will not pollute in their neighborhood. Um, but I think it's just a lot of that is the activism that kind of comes together too. So it's the music, activism, the, the even around the culture of like building neighborhoods. Um, it's really beautiful. So people don't realize, like you know, people talk about gentrification, but there are certain neighborhoods and communities where uh, you know white Detroiters been there forever. You know, they they they've been part of an integral part of uh, you know the the culture of Detroit. Uh, but but they also are so proud. So incredibly proud of being part of this beautiful black city. Uh, it's yeah. something they they rear, you know, on their shoulders very proudly, right, uh, Michael? Yeah. I mean, you feel it even when you talk. You you know who's an original Detroiter and who isn't. When you know they're not shy about saying, "Yes, uh, I'm I'm part of this incredibly." Beautiful oh, yeah, city. no, there's no shame. There's nothing but pride. I would say yeah. definitely that. And yeah. same thing in in Flint. Do you ever sit there in Detroit and just um, look a half a mile across the river? to a foreign country <laughs> people that um, are not that different from us in, in, in Detroit and in Michigan. And yet just a half a mile away, they never have to worry about if they get sick, that they're going to lose their home or they, 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 they have certain structures to protect them that there's, there's, there's paid sick leave. There's, you know, the, uh, you can, you can go to the university and it, 
And instead of it costing twenty to fifty thousand dollars a year, eh, some of them you can go you can go ten thousand maybe <laughs> over there. Why is that? And why do they live four years longer than us? I'm referring, of course, to the friggin' Canadians who are just across a, a very narrow river. And yeah. and I don't and know. I, would think I, mean, that, I, I remember. Go ahead. No, no, I would just, no, I'm just thinking during this time of pandemic and, you know, just what I've read and what I've heard in terms of how they decided to treat it because they have a leader who believes in science and treats things, you know, in such manner. And it's just, <clears throat> I just, I don't know. I've always had this feeling living in Michigan that, God, it's right there, everybody. It's right there. You know, <laughs> can't we just invade and steal it and bring it back or something. I don't know, but it just, it just drives me crazy that, um, that, and I'm, and look, I'm glad for the Canadians that they, they get to have a slightly better life, but shouldn't we all have that? Shouldn't that be yeah. something that we look at them and say, yes, you know, and when I try to explain Medicare for all or whatever to people, sometimes I just say Canadian, it's Canadian. We need Canadian healthcare. We need what they yeah. got, whatever they got. That's what I want. Well, I mean, you know this. Uh, I mean, many of our my neighbors here in my district, they go there to get their prescription when they can't afford it here. I mean, yes, you know, it's been know kind of a godsend. Yeah. So it's, and it's, how it's many, hard. I don't, and, and all the Canadian nurses who every day drive oh, across the bridge thousands, or through the tunnel, thousands, thousands who come into Detroit, into Michigan yeah. to help us. One, one hospital, 60% of their workforce is Canadian. One oh of the major God. hospitals. Wow. Yeah. It's almost, I mean, they don't, the Canadians are too polite to ever say this, but they are like doing missionary work. They come through the Windsor tunnel and they spend their day risking their lives to take care of us. And, um, I'm so grateful to them and to any Canadian who's listening, uh, for, for doing that. But it's sad, Rashida, it's sad that, um, not that I don't want them to come and work in Michigan, but, but why are we, why are we at this point and how do we get out of it? And I, I need, I need your answer in less than 30 seconds. <laughs> <laughs> you know, when we honestly, when we stop treating uh, billionaires and corporations and all these folks as some sort of like credible sources of what we need as a, as a, as a, as a people in the United States, when they are not given so much, I mean, you know, it was Congressman John Dingell who taught me the balance of power between, you know, the workers, right. And, and, the, the millionaires and those that have uh, was, you know, that Congress was kind of this buffer, right? It was working class people there. It was those folks that pushed against the kind of, you know, uh, you know, workers dying in the workplace. I mean, this stuff really did happen. I mean, all right. of those things. He, he said, now it's, you know, he, he said this to me before he goes, look at now, now, you know, corporations are all of a sudden people and uh, and then I told him, I heard that half of the, and it's true, half of the members of Congress right now are millionaires. I mean, they're in an the income wow. class that will never, ever truly understand what it means to live check by check or what it means to have to go into a workplace where, you know, there's been confirmed COVID and you ran out of sanitizer and you don't know what to do. And I mean, these are real life things that are happening to people. But it, again, I don't think that's going to change until we get more people in there to take out these folks. And, you know, I think it's the first African-American elected to Congress, Shirley Chisholm used to say, Hey, if there's no seat at the table, bring a chair. I'm in the school of thought. No, how about, uh, you go to the table, shake the table, you know, you know, butt bump the person in that chair and take the chair because I'm at this point, not expanding the table as much as, you know, taking the, the, that power away from those that have uh, and getting people in there that fully understand the importance of, of fixing our healthcare system, fixing all the brokenness that we have across the country now. Just before we go, um, I just want to ask you, I read something in the paper that you uh, either proposed a bill or introduced a bill this past week to create a, a, a civilian or civil service corps um, can you explain uh, what that is? Because it sounded like a, a really good idea. Uh, what, what, are you talking about the uh, uh, first responder corps? So, yes, I, so yes. this, yeah, yeah. So I introduced the uh, Automatic Boost to Communities Act, which would give people two thousand dollars on a precharged debit card every every uh, month 
until the pandemic is over and then $1,000 after that a year out. Um, what's so great is, so, so the debit card, um, pre-charged debit card is now being used by the treasurer, which I'm glad they're doing that. We just now got to get them to commit to, uh, you know, a people's bailout versus uh, corporations and those folks. But in there, we also tucked in the, the importance of going ahead and, and getting folks to work, you know, with us as first responder corps, uh, you know, similar to the AmeriCorps and, and, and Peace Corps, but really getting folks and there's huge uh, support for it across the board from Republicans, Democrats, outside of the halls of Congress, of course, but in the streets, people believe that that direct human contact of having folks going to the people uh, and, and the most vulnerable communities, some of the hardest reaching areas from rural, Michael, to, to urban communities. But there are too many people, especially during this pandemic, that are never going to get access to information because they don't have internet, because they don't have a TV, you know, all of those things. And as a community, again, being the third poorest, I've been to some of those neighborhoods where I go door to door and some people say, oh, how can they live like that? But that's the reality of poverty in our country. And it's true. It's real. Uh, you know, I have an elderly couple uh, that has to, you know, get water dropped off at their home because they just they can't afford water. It's become unaffordable because of the for profit entity coming in and souping that up. But it it it, uh, it is critical. And the first responder corps. I mean, it would employ people. It would get them out there. I mean, so many folks are already doing a lot of this incredible work. I mean, my sister-in-law dropped everything she was doing and started building, you know, making gowns in her home. Some of the folks I saw making masks for our first responders, you know, some of that underground, like, uh, you know, restaurants and people's homes are now making food for our, our healthcare workers. I mean, so many people are ready to help others. And we, as a you know, a federal government, we should take a lead on that. We should welcome it. We should fund it. We should support it. Well, it sounds like a, a great idea, and um, I hope it. I hope it passes. Um, you. you know, we're out of time, but I just wanted to give you the last word here. And if you have, I, I love the idea of butt bumping somebody out of, uh, uh, especially some billionaire out of their chair, and having that. Mm-hmm being taken over by the people, any person, frankly, at this point, but, um, you know, people, Rashida right now, people are in a lot of despair and, um, and a lot of fear about the future. And, um, I'm not asking you for a, um, you know, some happy, 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 happy talk, uh, here. Um, but I, um, I guess maybe I'm just asking for it. I want to know what to do. I want to know what we're all going to do. Yeah. I mean, uh, what I've been telling my residents over and over again is when we show up for each other, we save lives and showing up can come in all different ways and it can be making the masks and delivering it. It can be checking on three of your neighbors uh, every single day. But when we show up for each other, it really um, matters. I mean, we, we really can save a life when we do that. And this, you know, pandemic is, opened a lot of our eyes and in some, you know, God, odd way, it's actually brought some communities closer together. Uh, and uh, even though not physically, people are leaning on each other and, and it's been really inspiring to watch. But I just, I just hope people in 2020 understand that, showing up for each other. I don't care if it's showing up at the polls, it's showing up to, you know, demand that somebody supports a First Responder Corps Act or if it's showing up and saying, hey, how come this, you know, like I go into stores and I'm like, how come the the worker doesn't have a mask? Are you not providing a mask? You know, <laughs> and again, I'm, you know, as a customer, knowing the power I have and in walking into space and thinking, well, I want to make sure uh, that I'm protecting every single person or neighbor when I when I go and and, and spend my money there or, or, you know, again, not doing it blindly. I think when we do nothing and we stay on the sidelines and just wait for something to happen. People are going to lose their lives. Mm. When do we, when do we smash capitalism? <laughs> I don't know. Like we're working on it. We're, I'm just, working we're, doing, on it. we're doing our best, right? We are, we are in, in the, the, the people are, uh, I mean, we, we, we make up a lot more uh, than the money and all that stuff. So we just, we got to push back against the numbness and the indifference and 
have people believe that that everything they think is impossible is possible. We can do that. Yes, I do believe that we can do that. And, um, but it's going to take all of us, everybody's, uh, everybody's got to get off the bench and um, participate at this point. Um, and especially if we're going to succeed in November, um, as you said, I, I don't take him uh, for granted one single bit. And I'm, um, um, I'm well aware of um, uh, his performance art and how it can succeed. It's a form of 21st century, what would, would, would have been, would have been called propaganda back in the 20th century. Um, oh, yeah. He knows, he knows how to mani- manipulate oh, and to so use dangerous. it well. So dangerous. It's very dangerous. It's very dangerous. And um, um, so we have, we have a lot of work to do. You have a lot of work to do. I'm grateful that you're there. Uh, you're in your first uh, term. Uh, you will be up for re-election also here uh, in November. And um, and you have a primary to get through first, I believe, right? When, it, what, yeah, when is that? 4th. August 4th. August 4th. Wow. Well, yeah. everybody listening. Now, you know, yeah. <laughs> you sure and vote. Then, you know, and I usually vote in Michigan, by the way. Your applications are going to be in the mail soon for your or a ballot to come in the mail so you can safely yes. in your own comfort of your home vote uh, as you like. No rushing, no lines. Uh, again, I encourage it. Yes, yes. Thanks to those women in Lansing who've been sending <laughs> sending out these ballots. You know what, Michael, let's watch and see because, <laughs> you know, he has to wear a mask when he, you know that Trump's coming, right? Yeah, so yeah. We're going to see if he wears a mask. He's going to go to a... Wait, a no, wait. It's, yeah, he's going to a Ford assembly line and I, he, you know, I'm going to see if he wears a mask and I want to see if, if attorney general Dana Nessel, uh, uh, says it's some sort of violation. Because it's, law. it's a law. Yeah. It's a law. Right now. It's a law. But yeah. Well, it's, it's required. Yeah. So we'll see what happens, but yeah, he, he can't, you know, he's, he's coming down here and after insulting, you know, after just attacking, the governor, the, the, I mean, he attacked, uh, I think every single person so far that is, is trying to lead the state and, and making sure again, people are safe, but we'll see what well, happens. We'll see what happens. Um, and I look forward to what happens uh, here with you this year. And, um, thank you. Thank you for serving. Uh, thank you for becoming the first Muslim woman to represent the people of America in the United States Congress. You, well, you sure. and, 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 uh, and, uh, Ilhan. Uh, Omar, yeah. but, but we, we, you know, we put in, in, we, we have to put Michigan first before Minnesota. No offense. It's just, <laughs> it's how the sun works. We're, we're an hour, we're an hour ahead of Minnesota. I've told, I've told Ilhan this before, you know, we're always going to be an hour ahead of you. So I try to catch up if you can, but that's just the way it works. So, um, we, uh, you hear New York city outside my window here. <laughs> yeah, I do. And, uh, <laughs> A I sad got sound kids. these days. You got oh you oh, yeah, have your two boys been there in the uh, in there with it the during this entire podcast? Oh yeah, no, I've been homeschooling. Wow. Oh, my God, third grade math. Get out! I haven't of heard me. a peep. I haven't oh. heard a peep out of them. Oh no, I closed the door. I could hear them. Uh, according to Basil, he couldn't hear them, but uh, they, were, they he was playing video games, so he's real loud. Yeah, one may so have knocked the other problem. out. You might want to go check. I'm just saying, you know, <laughs> something might. I don't have know happened. my fourth. 14 year old Adam, who's a huge fan of this podcast, which by the way, you, I don't know if you heard somebody kind of interrupt me and he's like, when you're done, I need to talk to you. So I, t- I show him a text. <laughs> uh, I said, Hey, I'm on Michael. He goes, that's Michael Moore. I'm like, yeah, you've met him before. And, but he's just, <laughs> I think he loves your podcast and I, I let him oh. listen. Even though oh. I, I know. Oh, thank you. It really, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I know. That's so great to hear and tell him, tell him, thank you. And thank you to all the other 14 year olds out there who are listening to this. Um, but uh, Rashida Tlaib, thank you so much. Um, and uh, we'll see you next time, maybe down in Washington, DC. And in the meantime, to everybody who's listening, uh, don't forget to get on in on the uh, 10 million, be the, be the 10 millionth person to download this. Send us uh, an email. We'll pull the winner out. Mike at michaelmore.com. Send it right now and, uh, and tell your friends and neighbors about this podcast. It's Rumble with Michael Moore and um, grateful to all of you and uh, grateful to our one wonderful Congresswoman uh, who's fighting the good fight for us uh, there in DC. Thank you again, Rashida. No, thank you, Michael. Take care. 
All right, be well and be well, everyone. Mm-hmm.